My guest today is Stuart Stevens, a former Republican and a senior advisor to the Lincoln Project. We had him on the show a while back to talk about why he left the Republican Party. And I asked him back today to talk about his new book, The Conspiracy to End America. Stuart, welcome back to Burn the Boats. Thanks, man. Thanks for asking me. Uh, Your last book, It Was All a Lie. I've got it behind me somewhere. That one made me angry. This one terrified me. Uh, I'm guessing that was your goal. And I'd love for you to cover those five ingredients that fuel the autocratic movements. Then we'll dive into a couple of them. Um, Yeah. uh, uh, Well, thanks for doing this. Um, You know, the reason I wrote this book is that uh, when you read a lot about how democracies fall into autocracy and, you know, it's not an obscure subject. People have written brilliant books on. Um, And there seem to be five elements that always were present. And we talk about and write about and discuss, cover, report these five elements, but I don't think we do enough of their collective impact, both directly how they're connected and synergistically how they're connected. Um, and just to go through it, the five, uh, in no particular order of importance were support of a major party, which certainly, you know, Re- Republican Party is a autocratic movement now, what it is. You need financiers and God knows they have that out the wazoo, you know, the Peter Thiel's of the world and everybody else. You need propagandists, which, <laughs> I mean, you look at Fox News and Fox News has sort of become the New York Times of the far right. There's like, you know, they're, they're like the establishment. Um, you need shock troops, which we saw on January uh, 6th. And you need, uh, and I think this is probably the most important, actually, um, a legal system to justify it. So if Georgia passes a law saying they can overturn the presidential election popular vote when they do it you can't say it's illegal it's like perfectly legal um and that is where i think the most uh underreported and potentially impactful uh efforts are being made um you know we all we all know about the federalist society now and and i go into this in the book and i was really struck you know the federalist society began the weekend retreat in Yale in 1984 with the innocuous title, something like, you know, the future of the conservative judiciary. So you cut now, and it's hard to say the Federalist Society didn't win. And the guy who emerged to lead the Federalist Society, Leonard Leo, um, he was given $1.6 billion in the largest political contribution ever in America. Um, and that most of that money he is directing to various groups that are about the business of changing how we vote. It is a, a comprehensive effort. It's led uh, to a large degree by Clea Mitchell, who was this once very normal attorney uh, from Oklahoma, who actually led the movement for Oklahoma to pass the ERA, who ended up sucked into Trump world, who was in the Oval Office when Trump called Raffensperger. I cannot imagine how she was not indicted. I suspect there's a story here. Um, and they're doing this comprehensive effort as much as they can below the radar screen to train everything from training uh, volunteers that, you know, which our elections largely depend on, to electing elect- election officials uh, from Secretary of State to uh, other election officials at the precinct level. And she goes around holding these meetings and Ostensibly, they're supposed to be off the record, but because, you know, this is 2023, everybody has a recording, the recordings emerge. And one of her standard opening lines is, if you see a group that has democracy in its title or in its definition, these are not our friends. 
So you, you got to hand it to Clay. She's kind of like putting it out there, you know. It's no, no, like subterfuge, <laughs> no. Um, and you know, these are very serious people. And I think one of the weird dynamics is there's so many buffoonish people on that side. You know, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Lauren Bopart, the Mike Guest, that it's very easy to say these are a bunch of buffoons, <laughs> but they're not. Um, and I think it would be very irresponsible to believe that it's inevitable that they will be defeated. I just reread for this interview that chapter about the legal underpinnings for for any autocratic movement to succeed, and you open it with that with that quote. Um, <laughs> no, it's incredible. Huh? It's it's un it's unbelievable. And I reread that chapter in particular because I agree with you. That is probably the scariest of the five. Yeah. I mean, that's saying something because shock troops are pretty scary as well. But when you have a legal architecture that is propelling you in this direction, I mean, it's evocative of the legal justification for I, I'm going to I'm going to break Godwin's law here. But the Holocaust itself had a legal architecture. That's the first thing they did. They made sure they could justify it legally. Uh, and by the way, Mike Godwin said when it comes to autocracy in America today, yes. his law no longer applies. So I, I, I think. We're yes, okay. yeah, you, you get a pass. <laughs> we get a I pass. actually think it's, it's really important to talk about the 1930s. Um, and, you know, when I wrote It Was All a Lie, um, I mean, I originally started writing that book because, I mean, you know, there are a lot of people wrong about 2016, but it's really, really, really hard to find anybody more wrong than me. I didn't think that Trump would win the primary. I didn't think he'd win the general. And when he did, I had a lot of these Republican friends said, ah, oh, man, you know, like Trump hijacked the party. And I'm like, guys, I don't know. I'd like to think that. But, you know, when the hijacker's on the plane, he's not popular with the passengers. You know, people aren't saying, well, I'm glad we're not going to grandma's house. We're going to go to Cuba. And uh, Trump's really popular on the plane. <laughs> so I don't think we can really say he hijacked it. And I started asking myself the question, you know, how did I miss this? I mean, I, I, I was right in all this. And then that old high school English teacher says, if you can't write it, you don't understand it. I started writing some, not to really intend to make write a book. I ended up writing a book. But w when I was reading about trying to sort of go through this process of asking myself how I missed this. A book that still haunts me that I read were the memoirs of a Prussian aristocrat named Franz von Paffen, who probably more than anybody else was responsible for ushering Hitler into power. So in 1953, Franz von Paffen wrote a memoir. Say that now, again, 1953. 1953. 1953, yeah. You could say things had gone a little sideways. 100 million people dead, you know, World War, Holocaust. And he was still trying to justify what he did, what they did. And their justification is exactly as it was with the Republican Party. So much so that there are phrases that, that he uses that are literally almost verbatim from what Mitch McConnell said in 19, uh, 2016. We'll be able to control him. We are more powerful. He will change. We will not change. And, and the justification for Hitler was really the same as the rationalization that so many Republicans went through to accept, and, and particularly elected officials and kind of the hierarchy department, to accept Trump. And, you know, for von Papen, it was, look, we, the governing class of Germany, mostly Prussian aristocrats, have lost touch with the working class, which was true. And they are becoming communist, which was true. There was a huge Bolshevik communist movement in the 1930s in Germany. And the only way that we can stop this country from going Bolshevik is if we have some connection to that. And the best connection to that that we have at the moment is Hitler. And, you know, von Papen says, OK, didn't work out like we thought. But you have to say in that moment we made that decision, it was the right choice. And I can promise you that Mitch McConnell is going to say the same on his deathbed. Um, 
And, you know, if, if you read, um, McKay Coppins, I think brilliant book on Mitt Romney that he just wrote. Uh, Mitt ruminates on this a lot. Rationalizations. How, how you come to rationalizations and the role of ambition in personal r- rationalizations in politics. And it's really fascinating to read that section. Um, so I think that's, I think we have to talk about 1930s Germany. And, you know, when I look at all these people that I helped elect, some of whom became, you know, good friends of mine, I, I never in a million years would have thought they'd endorse Trump. Never. And they did. One of the, the striking differences, and I agree with a lot of the parallels you draw, and everyone should be reading von Papen in the in the run up to, to you can get it on kindle for some reason <laughs> i have no idea why there's such a demand for friends i'm having to put it on kindle but i'm glad they did but he was representative of an aristocracy that had lost touch mm-hmm. with the the public you have you either wrote this or said this recently that our greatest political divisions are not defined by class but by choice and that, I don't know if it's entirely new in the history of political conflict, but I can't think of great examples of this kind of fractiousness driven by choice and not not class, not any of the things that normally divide a polity. It's people deciding that they hate each other. Yeah, you know, um, one of the uh, interesting analysis that have been done a lot about those who participated in January 6th and have been arrested. And it's a fascinating study that, I forget who did it, but um, a couple of academics did. I think they were Hopkins. You know, and they have studied right-wing movements a lot, which, I mean, you've done a lot of brilliant work on that stuff yourself, looking at how the military has done this. And their point was that these were middle-class people. And that usually there is economic anxiety that drives these sort of a separateness that drives the fringe groups. David Kors was like a guy who didn't fit into society. Randy Weaver was a guy, you know, who wanted to be left alone, um, who kind of got hooked on these things. But, you know, he, he was not a fully functioning member of society, went out and lived, you know, this isolated life in Idaho. Um which is how kind of the Northwest has become like the Green Bay of the, you know, fringe militia movement. You know, they, they want to be left alone, a lot of them. So that's why they always find that, you know, build compounds. They, they, they have a separate society. But those, for the majority who were arrested on January 6th, were fully functioning members of society who were in the middle class. Some took private jets to, you know, overthrow the government because they were suffering so much. You know, roll that around in your head. Um, and what is most troubling about that, these, uh, they argue, these ac- academics argue, that normally the path to solve this problem, say, is by integration into society. That once people begun to become uh, feel that there's a path in society that accepts them, that gives them upward mobility. They're no longer mad at the world. Um, but here, that's not the case. Um, and look, in 2020, the only economic group that Trump carried were those who make over $100,000 a year. I'm glad you said that. I was going to bring it up. It, it seems like the angriest Trump supporters are the ones who who have everything. <laughs> it's very troubling. Um, and it's, it's utterly bizarre to me. And, and I say this not rhetorically. I literally do not understand it. There is this odd phenomenon in America of individuals who have prospered in America like they could under no other system on earth. Elon Musk. Uh, the Koch brothers, Peter Thiel, and they have decided, having Mark Zuckerberg increasingly so, they have decided 
that their reaction to this system that allowed them to amass unimaginable wealth and power is we have to end that system and change it. It's very odd. You know, I mean, it would be, it would be like, you know, Steve Jobs saying, you know, this Apple thing, we got to shut down. Like, you know, it really just, you know, I, I don't know. Um, and I, f- I find there are less dramatic ramifications of that to go through the whole donor class of Amer- of, of Republican Party. So after January 6th, there were a lot of corporate donors who said, we're not going to give to those who voted against certification. And probably 80% of them kind of held true to that through 2020. But the loophole in that is, okay, they don't give to, you know, nut job congressmen, but they give to the Republican Congressional Committee, which then gives the money to the nut job congressmen. Or they give to the Republican Senatorial Committee, who then gives the money to Ted Cruz. So it's kind of a moral laundromat that they can, they can go through. And so you want to ask, like, you know, would you rather be CEO in America or Russia? Like, why is it you don't sort of understand what the Republican Party's become? So look at Ron DeSantis. This whole idea that, you know, Republicans were less government, less government interference, free enterprise. If Ron DeSantis gets in a fight with the happiness company, how in God's name does a Republican governor get in a fight with Mickey Mouse and lose? Um, you know, so what does, what does the happiness company do? They cancel a billion dollar expansion they were planning for Florida that was going to be 20,000 jobs with an average over $120,000 a year of salary. And there's not a governor in America that if you said, you know, I want you to walk naked from your house to the state capitol and Disney will move to your state, they'd ask, what's the catch? Like, I'm leave, can I leave now? You know, where do I sign this deal? Um, but it, it's a, a reflection. So, you know, the personal freedom party, which is what I thought the Republican party was, stupid me. You know, they now believe that it's a deep, egregious, unfathomable violation of your personal rights if you're asked to wear a mask. But for a 12 year old girl who's raped to be forced to carry her rapist child to term, that's not a violation of her rights. Yeah. How do you? How do you square that? And which just goes to my point, I do not think that there is a conservative party in America. I think I one mean, of the explanations of that fealty to Trump in defiance of, of not just all the evidence, but where he's actually taking the country is this observation you make that, uh, that Trump, quoting from the book, has made it acceptable to embrace your worst self. I think that permission yeah. structure is so liberating for so many of his supporters. And once that becomes acceptable, it's very easy. It's, I think, sort of addictive. This must have been an interview you did. And now that's where the party is. It's become a grievance party and primarily a white grievance party. Yeah. I mean, it's like saying, look, without a doubt, you will be more healthy. You will lose weight if you eat a lot of chocolate. Like, I want that deal, man. <laughs> like, where do I sign? I'll take it. Um, and, you know, I, I get into this argument all the time with, you know, the few Republican friends I've left. They, because I really believe ultimately this is all about race. Um, and they go, so I voted for Donald Trump. I'm a racist. I go, no. But it means you care about something more important than having a racist as president. Because you can't argue that Donald Trump isn't a racist. It's impossible. And I, I, I really, I, I find this fascinating because, you know, I worked for Romney. We lost, by the way. Um, but Mitt Romney would have led the party in a very different direction. And I think people have a better sense of that now because they've had a better sense of who Mitt Romney is. But it would have been the same party. So what does that tell us? You know, I think it goes to the question of why in the 1930s when America had a huge fascist movement did we not become fascist? Probably because Roosevelt was president and not Henry Ford or Lindbergh. So maybe, and you've, you've written about this, talked about it a lot, addressed it in your, in your film. Maybe what we learned in civics class when we still had them, this leadership matters was true. 
So now, see, I, I, I see it as a complete collapse of the Republican Party because I think there are a lot, a lot of people out there who always thought Trump was kind of weird, like this sort of fat guy from Queens. It's like, you know, like, you know, talks about having sex with his daughter. This is just weird. But then their governor, who they know, their Republican governor, their Republican senator, Republican congressman, they endorse Trump. So it's kind of a thing, okay, look, that person knows Trump better than me. He must be okay. So that's a permission structure that's given. And, you know, one of the things that I kind of went through as an intellectual, I mean, whatever, a what if. What, you know, I worked for Bush in 2004. We won the popular vote. The only time since 1988 Republicans won the popular vote. But we always realized we were very lucky to win the popular vote. So, you know, if a good bit less in a full stadium at a home game at Ohio State to change their votes, we would have lost. Would have lost Ohio, would have lost. So what if John Kerry, you know, if you remember on election night in 2004, uh, Bush did not declare victory until the next day. And we knew that we'd won, but it was still close enough that theoretically, if every provisional vote that was out there went against Bush 100%, you could make a case to Kerry might win. Now, not every provisional vote is going to go. I mean, it, was, it was impossible, but okay, fine. Like, you know, we'll wait a day. Um, but what if Kerry had gone out and said he won, refused to accept Bush winning? What would have happened? Well, play it out. The Democratic Party wouldn't have stood behind him. I mean, these people, senators and Republican and, and Democratic congressmen, they wouldn't have gone out and said, well, we don't know who won. Da, da. They would have been calling Kerry and saying, you're out of your fucking mind. You're ruining the party. You're killing us. You got to concede. And all the media that had endorsed him, New York Times, Washington Post, they would have called for his head. We withdraw our endorsement. This is one of the more, you know, devastating turns of American politics. This has ruined John Kerry's legacy. If there's any hope left for, you know, and that's not what happened in the Republican Party. That's not what happened with the, the media that endorsed Trump. They all stood behind Trump. And, you know, all they had to do was get these Republican elected officials, get their comm shops to put out a statement saying, congratulating the president elect the United States. I mean, to defend democracy, I mean, what have you seen and what have you done to defend democracy? A hell of a lot more. What did people like my dad, you know, fought three years in the South Pacific, $28 landings, came home, never talked about it, like hundreds of thousands of others. That's the legacy these Republicans inherited. And yet they can't even get their comm shop to say congratulations. And I, you know, I, I find it appalling I am extraordinarily judgmental about it. I think that they're cowards and failures. I think they're going to be recorded as such in history. And I, I don't care that I think 99% of them would be really good neighbors. You know, they passed you on the road and you had a flat tire, they'd stop. These aren't bad people, but they failed this moment. Indeed. And you place that moral burden, it seems, entirely on this party, the Republican Party. Oh. I'm wondering if there is something, though, about modern conservatism itself, if there is a sensibility mm -hmm. within the movement that lends itself towards authoritarianism, towards um, excusing um, anti-democratic behavior. And I ask because America's yeah. Republican Party isn't the only conservative party that suffers from this. All around the world today, you have yes. rightist movements, conservative movements that are reacting in much the same way. And I don't think we can ignore that that pattern. Yeah, 100 percent. It's a fascinating question. Um, you know, I, I would say the answer in America is democracy became the enemy. 
Because in a world that is changing as rapidly as America is, right? So 1956, Eisenhower gets 39% of the black vote. That drops to 7% in 64 with Goldwater when he opposed the Civil Rights Act. Now, you could have made a case that a lot of African-Americans would drift back to the Republican Party because of shared values of patriotism, social conservatism, faith, entrepreneurship. It didn't happen. Trump got 8%. So that's one point every 56 years. I mean, do the math. It's going to take a while to get back to 39. And, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan, 1980, wins a sweeping landslide with 55% of the white vote. John McCain, 2008, loses a not particularly close race with 59% of the white vote. And therein lies the story. If you believe that, what is democracy? Democracy are people voting. If you believe that then leads to your defeat, you become anti-democratic if you're unwilling to change. And that was a great failure of the Republican Party when I was in it, but at least we admitted it was a failure to appeal to more non-white votes. And, you know, uh, we're becoming a minority-majority country, in some cases some one way you could say we already are a minority majority country, those who are 16 years and under are non-white in America. You know, I'm, I'm betting on the odds they'll be non-white when they're 18. And Republicans know this. Uh, and that's why they're trying to curate the vote. So you change. So you look at Hungary, right? Okay, it's not about race per se in Hungary, though part of Viktor Orban's rise to power has been a fear of uh, non-whites. It's about immigration, if not race. About immigration, which are non-whites. I mean, and Viktor Orban has said, forget the exact quote, but it's mixed races. We do not want a country of mixed races. He said this before he was invited to give the keynote address at the American Conservative <laughs> at CPAC. You know, uh, wrap your mind around that. Um, but I, I think it is a like failure of democracy. And in a parliamentary system, as was the case in Germany, they're not winning with a majority. You know, they, they're, they're, they're coming to power with a minority. And this is one of the encouraging things about the recent Polish elections, that they were able to defeat this despite a lot of odds against them, a lot of state-owned media that was, you know, spreading a lot of lies. Um, I think autocracy is driven by fear. Democracy is driven by hope. And I think that's a fundamental difference. If, if you read the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, it is an aspirational document. It is a hopeful document. It's not an accurate description. <laughs> you know, all men were not created equal. Um, but it puts something that we should aspire to. And, and that was always, you know, the role of politics in America and to be successful. Usually the most optimistic candidate won. And it, it was true consistently. Um, and with Trump, that really changed. And a major party adopted fear and hate as its platform. And what? yeah, finish the thought. No, and once you do that, it's very hard to unravel. And you know what I find so so extraordinarily I don't know what the word is, depressing or telling. The one group of Americans who really do have grievance, who really do have a right to not believe in the American system are African Americans. You know, they were enslaved, tortured, murdered, killed, raped, laws passed against them to stop them from participating in the American system. And yet they never gave up. They didn't seize the Capitol. They marched in Washington. So I respect that. I have no respect for these others. 
And, you know, personally, I have zero desire to understand the guy in the Camp Auschwitz sweatshirt. I don't care. You know, I, I don't need to read another piece about Trump voters and diners. I don't care. Hey, everyone. Quick break coming up. I just wanted to remind you to like and subscribe. And if you've got a couple seconds, click the link below to the podcast version of this show and give us a five-star rating. It makes a huge difference. Thanks. Lomi is the only appliance that prevents food waste from stinking up your kitchen and polluting the planet. Now that I've invested in a Lomi, it's changed the way I deal with my food waste. Lomi is the biggest innovation in the modern day kitchen since the dishwasher. Lomi has helped me turn my home into a climate solution. Now I can transform my organic waste into nutrient rich Lomi earth that I can feed to my plants, lawn or garden instead of sending it to the landfill. I can help the environment and make my life easier. In just four hours, Lomi transforms almost anything you eat into nutrient-rich plant food at the push of a button. It's smart, simple food recycling that fits my space perfectly. Cut the chore of doing the trash in half and eliminate bugs and odors in your kitchen. And here's a bonus. You get to feed your lawn and garden with an all-natural fertilizer that you just created out of your food scraps. All my food scraps, plant clippings, and even those leftovers I forgot in the back of the fridge can go back into my garden, helping me grow more nutritious food at home. Food waste makes up a huge portion of our personal carbon footprint. By reducing the amount of food I send to the landfill, I'm helping do my part for the planet. Whether you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just grow a beautiful garden, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash boats and use the promo code boats to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash boats and use promo code boats at checkout. Thank you, Lomi, for sponsoring this episode. If you're like me, morning coffee is non-negotiable, but I was tired of either waiting in line for an overpriced cup or settling for gritty, bitter coffee at home. Now, I've switched to using AeroPress, and I'm never going back. It's so easy and convenient and unique. I never knew coffee at home could taste this good. AeroPress is like a French press, only better. It's the only press that uses a patented three-in-one brew technology, combining the best of several brew methods into one portable device for a completely unique and delicious flavor profile. Smooth, rich, and full-bodied, without the bitterness and grit found in other presses. And as a bonus, AeroPress can brew thousands of recipes. AeroPress travels better than others, too. It's compact and incredibly durable, that means you'll never have to endure terrible coffee at the hotel, on the job, or on an adventure again. It brews and cleans in less than two minutes. Just add medium-fine coffee grounds, pour in hot water, stir for five seconds, brew for 30 seconds, then press into your favorite mug and enjoy. There's a reason why AeroPress is the barista's favorite home brewing tool. AeroPress is the best-reviewed coffee press on the planet with more than 55,000 five-star reviews. Thoughtful, proven, and under $50, AeroPress is the perfect gift or stocking stuffer for every coffee lover in your life this holiday season. Don't settle for less than the best. They'll love it. AeroPress is shockingly affordable, less than 50 bucks, and we've got an incredible offer for our audience. Visit AeroPress.com slash boats. That's A-E-R-O-P-R-E-S-S dot com slash boats and save up to 20%. That's AeroPress.com slash boats to save up to 20%. It's time to ditch the drive through Toss the French press and say yes to better mornings fueled by better coffee. AeroPress ships to the USA and over 60 countries around the world. And we thank AeroPress for sponsoring our show. Can I connect this to conservatism and, and get your reaction? Yes. So conservatism, at least in its modern form, seems to be about preserving a social order, not preserving democracy. <laughs> And I think that is where the the anti-democratic impulse yeah. comes from. You talk about fear of change. You talk about inherent racism. If we play that out and and suggest that the conservatism of these parties around the world might have to be undemocratic in order to preserve the social yes. order, it explains a lot. I, I think that's I think that's dead on and brilliant. Um and you see it play out. What is happening in Russia but a 
the creation of a mythical past that you're in love with, which when you say make America great again, what, oh, yeah. what does that mean? a mythical path? Yeah. Um, and it's basically a social order that you knew your place and were not, you were unquestioned. And a social order in which, you know, as Putin says, and every, everybody knows this to be true, there are no gays in Russia. I mean, every, everybody knows that. Um, you know, there are no women in power in Russia. Uh, they're all good Christians. Although if you think Vladimir Putin's a Christian, you're insane. And there's, you know, millions and millions and millions and millions of Muslims in Russia. Um, it is a world in which elections are performative, not determinative. Um, and I think it's, it's very true. And there's not, that's not a theory of government. That's, that's a, what is it? It's a, I don't even know what you would call that instinct, but it, 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 it's, it's not a governing philosophy. I mean, say what you will about Elizabeth Warren, right? You can talk to her. She has a theory of government. You can love it. You can hate it, but she'll argue and she'll be brilliant and you can make your case. I, listen, man, I worked 30 years in the Republican Party, conservative side. You said like, you know, I'm going to hold a gun to your head. You got five minutes to describe American conservatism today. I'd say, shoot me. Let's just get this done. Well, I have no idea. I mean, I don't think anybody else is. I Why mean, do the better angels never win? There are still old school conservatives. Um, we used to call Glenn Youngkin one of those. But as you've pointed out, when he went to Arizona to campaign for Carrie Lake, he didn't change her. She changed him. And now we see a different Glenn Youngkin. Yep. It's because to rise in the Republican Party, you have to pass a purity test, which is increasingly the barrier for that is high. Um, look, wh why is it that all these people I worked with for the most part, not all, I mean, I, I listen, I, I wrote a book about the Bush campaign in 2001 called The Big Enchilada. And I predicted in that book that someday Liz Cheney would run for president because I worked closely with her in debate prep for her dad. And she was so impressive. Right. So it doesn't surprise me that Liz is held true. It doesn't surprise me that her dad is held true. Um, if you ever want to have a podcast just about Cheney, I'll be glad to make sure that I'm the most unpopular, second most unpopular person in America and defend Cheney. Um, but, um, you know, Mitt Romney held true. Um, they're out there. But, but why? they're not in the party. Why, why did my friend Chris Christie, a guy I worked in all his races, love him? sat in his living room, talked to him about running for governor when he's U.S. attorney. Why did he endorse Trump? I, you know, when I did, it was, when I wrote all, it was all a lie and I started doing interviews. I would get asked questions like that. And I found that, like, I, I would just get emotional. I would just choke up. I couldn't answer it. I, 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 I mean, I remember vividly standing in the Atlanta airport watching Christie endorsed Trump and like tears came to my eyes. I felt like I was watching your friend overdose. Like, Chris, what have you done? Why? What do you get out of this? And so now, you know, he's saying what he always believed. But like, why, Chris? I, I, I mean, the guy tried to kill you in 2020 in debate prep with COVID. He waited to January 6th to try to kill Mike Pence. Hell, man. Um, I, I, you know, Romney, again, in this McKay Coppins book, he ruminates a lot on this, you know, and asks himself, when are there moments when he thought ambition drove him to do something he really didn't believe? Um, I mean, this is why I ended up writing a book about the Republican Party because it was all a lie. Because if you really believe this stuff, you don't change. You know, you, those, those aren't values, they're marketing slogans. If you say character counts and then you, you support Trump, I mean, it's like, you know, remember there used to be this slogan, you know, Chevrolet's the heartbeat of America. Well, you, you didn't really believe you should take your card or a cardiologist. 
And that's how the Republican Party viewed these values. We call it values. I mean, some of us believed in it. You know, there's a little group of us. I mean, we literally used to sit in the same room. Me, Nicole Wallace, Matthew Dowd, the late, great um, writer, Michael Gerson, who wrote so many beautiful speeches and then became an op-ed. Pete Wainer, who writes Atlantic now. Um, Mark McKinnon has a circus, you know. I mean, we, we believe this stuff, you know, and it wasn't like we thought we were perfect, but we aspired to be something bigger and better than we were. And we look at Trump and it's like, we were wrong. I mean, this is, this is where the party is. Is there any hope of recovering it? I feel like you're, you're conflicted. Oh, you want hope? <laughs> is that what you're looking for? Well, I, I hear two things from you. <laughs> you got to get reasonable here, Ken. You, you got you to gotta, you know, you gotta, gotta get out of this crazy, crazy, you know. Next, you're going to say you want to be drafted in the NFL here, dude, you know. Um, uh, look, on one um, hand, you say that you you have to stop imagining that there is a possibility for the Republican Party to become normal again. On the other hand, and I think this is, you know, the optimist in you, you say that there is hope if it suffers crushing defeat after crushing defeat. I like that. Um, then just maybe it will begin to change reading from the book and return to some semblance of a normal center right party. Is that just you coming up with a way to end your book? Um, because <laughs> I just, well, what happens I, now? Here, here's, here's what I think. Here's what I think. I think that, um, I think there are millions and millions and millions of Americans who would like to identify with the same center right party. Yeah. And uh, there isn't one in America now. The only vehicle for there to emerge one is the Republican Party to change. You're not going to start a third party that's going to be successful in America. And the only way the Republican Party, I mean, this is my logic, the only way the Republican Party is going to change is by defeat. So you, you could have said there's some principle, some moment that the Republican Party will come to its senses. But to me, so you take January 5th, Mr. McConnell wakes up, he's majority leader, wakes up on January 5th, 2021, wakes up January 6th, he's minority leader, and he, he and his colleagues are running for their life. So in life as humans, if somebody organizes a mob that then comes into your office and tries to kill you and you still support that person, do we really think there's some principle they're going to come across <laughs> where, where they're going to, I don't know, man, this stuff about like the law of the sea treaty, that's too much, you know? Um, I, I, I've had it. I'm out of here. No, if you're willing to support the guy who tried to kill you, you're going to support him to the, you know, to the last dog dies, as Bill Clinton would say. Um, and that's just the reality. I mean, I don't think we've seen anything like it in American politics. Um, now, I do think that there is a sort of fascinating moment in the Democratic Party where, you know, there was a time when the Democratic Party, to a large degree, was the party of strength in foreign policy. You know, Nixon Kennedy, Nixon accused Kennedy of having a secret plan to invade Cuba. I mean, he ran, turned out he's right. Nixon, in many ways, ran to the left on foreign policy of, of, of Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy ran on a missile gap. And in the Vietnam War, for the most part, that changed. Um, and the Republican Party became the party that was defined by Ronald Reagan standing in front of the Berlin Wall saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. So who's the anti-Russia party now? Democratic Party. You know? Now, Donald Trump would stand in front of that and say, tear down this wall so we can join you. And I think that there, 
is this, which goes to kind of a, the social order you're talking about. I think a lot of conservative Americans, without really thinking about it much, because most people don't think about this stuff, they look at Putin and they see a world that they kind of like in Russia. Like I said, no gays, no women, no troubling, you know. They don't know anything about it. They don't know abortion is the number one birth control. <laughs> but still, you know, they, they. And I think that goes to a lot of the anti, anti-Ukraine efforts. But there's also just one little through line we never talk enough about. I don't know why. I mean, maybe because it's so, like, insane. Russia decided they wanted to elect an American president. They did. Donald Trump won. Now, you could, you could argue whether or not Donald Trump would have won without Russia or not. But as somebody who spent 30 years winning and losing elections, more winning than losing, causality in politics is the hardest thing to point to. So if you want to put me up in front of the Oxford Union and, make, and debate the side that Donald Trump would not have won without Russian interference, I'll do that. And I'll win that debate. I may not be right, but I can make a really good case for it. Um, not the least of which is it was a massive covert operation. And one of the aspects of covert operations is you never really know what they did. Um, so they got elected president. So what did they get? Turns out they got a lot. The leading pro-Putin element of American politics is now the part of American politics that used to be the greatest antagonist, the conservative element of the Republican Party. It would be the equivalent of, say, instead of the Soviet Union getting a group of, you know, aristocratic traders in the British government in the 40s, 50s, Kim Philby, these people. You got Churchill. Now, how would that have played out? Um, and I don't, I, it's the most successful covert operation in history. It's got to be. I mean, can you imagine, you know, you're sitting in those rooms in the FSB headquarters Pergozin being one of them, and you're designing this. I mean, I don't think there's enough vodka in Russia to think that they would have accomplished what they accomplished. You know, they would have said, well, you know, maybe we'll do this, da, da, da. They got the presidency. And right now, if Donald Trump wins, it'll be devastating for Ukraine. Devastating. Well, for for all of Europe eventually. For all of Europe, for Western society. Western society. If you want to drive from Warsaw, from Paris to Warsaw, you better do it now. Because in five years, if Ukraine loses, you're not going to be able to. I want mm. to talk about political violence. We all point to January 6th as yeah. a. And your brilliant film. Thank you. Um, a, no, it is. A crescendo of political violence, the likes of which we've never seen, but obviously there was a lot that led up to that. And to me, the, the approval, the endorsement of political violence coming from political leaders now, uh, not just the apologies for the January 6th insurrectionists, but the, the performative violence of people like Mark Wayne Mullins. I don't know if you saw him stand up at the Senate hearing. Um, You've got Republican members of Congress assaulting each other in the halls that happened on the same day. And I know it, it seems like a massive leap to connect that to January 6th, but the desensitization that we've experienced, the bar has been, the threshold has been so lowered that violence from a sitting Senate. Think about, you know, I mean, I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, right? You know, the disputes that used to be settled out behind the crystal in the parking lot after the Friday night football game are now <laughs> what's happening in the United States Senate. Yeah. You know, and most of us thought we were, you know, you're an idiot if you went out there and settled it behind the crystal when we were 16. Um, I, you know, there's been a long re- Republican principle. We ought to reduce the size of federal government. Okay, we never did it. We just increased it. But say that. So now how does DeSantis verbalize that? Not that we need to reduce the size of the government. We need to slit their throats. How does DeSantis articulate his opposition to Fauci's policies, though he endorsed Fauci's policies until he got a poll saying it wasn't good for him in his base? Not 
you know, I disagree with the, uh, these policies. Uh, you know, I think we need it. Somebody ought to throw that little elf across the Potomac, which is particularly ironic in considering that get the Santos in his bare feet and he's only a couple of inches taller than Fauci. Um, and I'm not sure Fauci couldn't talk to Santos. Um, and if you listen to the debate the other night, it was childish. It was like, you know, my daddy can beat up your daddy. This, you know, competition, who could be the most bellicose, who could be the most angry, who could be the most, um, you know, what country, I, I, I swear to God, the next debate, I, I, I promise you, at least Ramaswamy is going to be talking about invading Canada. You know, he went up to the Canadian border where I can, where from where I'm sitting, I can ride my bike to the Canadian border about half an hour. And let me tell you, I do it a lot. The northern border is looking good. There's not, there's not a real problem here with like Canadians are going to drive massive numbers of their Lexuses over the border to invade, you know, Vermont, New Hampshire. We don't need a wall. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, um, it, it is a, Normalization of violence. Um, that is an integral part of an autocracy. And when you l listen to what Republicans have said now about what they were being told by their colleagues, that they had colleagues who wanted to vote for certification, but were afraid for their lives and their families. Mitt talks about this. And I mean, Mitt's a guy who's spending five thousand dollars a day in security. And you know, most people can't afford to do that. Um, you know, I know when Liz Cheney was running for re-election, her campaign, her ability to move around in that state was greatly hindered by a realistic assessment of threats. And that's not a democracy. You know, if you can't vote the way you want to vote because you fear that the other side may kill you, that's not a democracy. So that's become acceptable. And, you know, there's, there's a really fascinating book by this uh, Canadian journalist, I forget his name, Stephen Marsh, I think it is. Yeah, we've, we've had Who him. wrote a very interesting book. Pardon? We've had yeah. him on the show. You, you know, yeah, right. It is Stephen Marsh, right? That's correct. Yep. Uh, the, 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 the posits that America is in a civil war. And, you know, one of the points he makes, what's the difference between January 6th and Fort Sumner? Well, nobody died at Fort Sumner. <laughs> Not a bad point. Um, and he goes through the degree to which people thought the civil war was unimaginable, even after Battle of Bull Run. Like, this is obviously going to... It's a very compelling book. Um, you know, as a seventh-generation Mississippian named for Jeb Stewart, I kind of take it personally, but, um, you know, we sort of tried this. Didn't work out too well. <laughs> you know, um, Stuart, you're, you're, you're chuckling, and, and I want to... <laughs> I want to use that to tee up my next question because in figuring out how to push back against these, these clownish macho performances in these, you know, provocations towards violence, one of my reflexive tools is mockery and satire. And I'm wondering yeah. if that works anymore. How do we push back against this, this movement that celebrates tactics that are antithetical to, to democracy when that same movement seems to be immune to the emotion of shame? If Trump has any superpower, uh, you, you've it's talked no about shame. it being, you know, the identification of, of the weaknesses in others, I think his supreme superpower is a lack of shame, and that seems to infect the the entire I, party. Listen, listen, Ken. I can't tell you how much I miss shame. Yeah. 
<laughs> I, I wake up every day wondering where it is. Um, I do think, and this is really what the Lincoln Project is all about. I do think, I do know for a fact that there is a group of voters in America of which that is a huge, still hugely motivating factor. And the single most effective tool that we found in the Lincoln Project, when we're focused on that five to, it's growing, but eight, nine percent now post Dobbs group of, uh, call them soft Republicans, though some are soft Democrats, um, who many of whom voted for Trump in 16 at the last minute after the Comey letter, um, who enough of them voted for Biden in 20 for him to win. And the single most effective way to reach these people is to ask them, is this who you really are? To hold up a Marjorie Taylor Greene screaming at somebody, to hold up a, a Donald Trump, to hold up a guy in a Camp Auschwitz sweatshirt, to hold up, you know, this buffoonish senator from Oklahoma, you know, getting out of his seat to get in a fight. And, you know, I mean, give me a break. You know, is this who you are? Is this what you teach your kids? You know, Trump made a huge miscalculation in the suburbs in 20 when he tried to scare white voters in the suburbs by the threat of non-whites moving in. And, you know, you know, a lot of people that live in the suburbs. You might live in the suburbs. I don't know anybody who lives in the suburbs who, if someone who was non-white or a different religion moved in next door, they wouldn't go out of their way to show their kids that they're welcoming. That's who they want to be. And that's who they want their kids to be. And, you know, if I ran the Democratic Party, God help us, I would wake up every day to get in the cultural war. Because I do think Americans are, are, Republicans are losing these cultural wars, which is a function of shame. So when the Republican Party went to war with Nike over Colin Kaepernick, who won? Nike made nine billion. And the Republican Party shut the fuck up about it. And I think there's shame in elements of that. When the Republican Party went to war with NASCAR because they banned the Confederate flag, who won that? I'm saying the Republican Party's in a war, casual war with NASCAR. When they went to war with Walmart over Walmart's mandatory mask uh, requirements for a while. I don't know, you know, last election, last Tuesday, you know, Republicans didn't do too well. I bet Walmart had a good day that day. I bet they sold a lot of shit. And so I think they're losing these culture wars. And that's a reflection of being out of step with America. But what we increasingly have for many, many reasons is minority rule in America. This is partly a function of our Constitution, with the U.S. Senate having two senators in every state. So the disparity between the size of the states when that Constitution was written was much, much smaller than it is now. So larger states are getting larger, and that's just going to continue. They're still going to have two senators. There are five United States justices in the history of America, Supreme Court justices, who have been confirmed by senators representing a minority of the country in their votes, and all five are on the court today. You have a, you know, a president in Trump who lost over 3 million votes. You know, I worked for Bush. So we, we lost a popular vote by half a million. We used to darkly joke amongst ourselves. It seemed kind of funny at the time. You know, anybody can win a race when you get more votes. It takes professionals when you lose by half a million. It seemed kind of funny. It doesn't seem very funny anymore. It probably never was funny. And as a side note, if you ever want to do a podcast just on this, I'll come on and do it. We don't talk enough about what a hero to America Al Gore is. For conceding. Because if ever there was a guy who had a moment to rip apart America, it was Al Gore. Um, and as I understand, you know, from a lot of his people whom I've gotten to know, you know, the first thing he told them after the decision was don't trash the Supreme Court. Because he thought that was more important than him winning that election. Where did that go? Yeah. You know, and Bush would have done the same. I know I was with Bush. I think there's a side of Bush that was hoping he'd lose at that point. I think it's probably a side of Gore, you know, like, and just get this thing over with. Um, but so I do think shame still works with that. Um, 
This is a problem Republicans have. Nobody wants to be Jim Gordon. Nobody likes these people. They're weird. They're people you don't want to sit next to on a plane. I mean, you see, you see Marjorie Taylor Greene on a plane, you're like, God, oh, man, they're like, I, I'm, I'm just going to keep walking down the aisle. Um, they're not likable. Um, and that's a huge thing, you know. Um, and, and it is a party without attractive leaders. So Glenn Youngkin, so look at, look at who's running now for president. There's some sort of likable people up there. But then what do you do when to be considered, you have to say that you would vote for a guy if you lose a nomination, you support him, even if he's convicted of overthrowing the government of the United States. You know, that's a pretty disqualifying statement. Um, and you take like Nikki Haley. I wrote an article from the New York Times about this, you know, before she announced. If Nikki Haley had stayed who Nikki Haley was, she would really have standing to say what she's saying now, as would Chris Christie. But she didn't. You know, she 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 won't say that Donald Trump was a disaster. And so this is why Trump's winning. You know, I mean, think about it. You're in a race. What greater gift could you be given against your opponent than him to be convicted of a felony to overthrow the United States government? And yet you won't campaign against him saying that. Well, dude, you're going to lose. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you. It, and that's, that's the truth that the Republican Party is where Donald Trump is. Well, I, I hope you're right that there still are those in the middle for whom shame can be uh, a motivator. You're also right that some of the structures are are fundamentally democratic. It's the only way we can get a Senator Mark Wayne Mullins, who, by the way, after that shameful display in that Senate hearing, went back to Oklahoma and I am sure high-fived all his buddies. He's on camera saying that that's the only thing he could have done to be a man. Um, and he gets away with it. Yeah, you know, but if I, there are I, enough, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, my feeling about those guys when they do stuff like that, um, they should be required uh, to fight somebody. <laughs> they should, you know, maybe not Bernie Sanders, but, you know, there ought to be a pool of people of which, you know, I bet everybody you know would like pay money to rig the pool to be number one in that pool, <laughs> you know, um, that if you're going to go out and say this stuff, you know, you it's like Elon Musk. He's going to challenge Zuckerberg. You know, there ought to be, you know, if you say that stuff, you, you really should. Okay, there should be a fight. Yeah, you especially know? when you're challenging a teamster. That was my favorite part of the whole yeah. exchange. I, I, I think we all know how that would have gone down. Um, yeah, I'm kind of betting. Yeah, I, I, you know. I, 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 yeah. It, it's... Um, You know, as a parent, would you teach your kid to do that? Yeah. You know, you're going to call out your teacher. You know, and that's the weird thing about Trumpism. There, there, you think about all the social institutions in our country, sports teams, churches, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, boys clubs, girls. There's no... There's no part of our culture that says this is good. It's good to mock people. You know, you get suspended for school when you get in fights. As it should be. You know, I mean, and yet somehow that's acceptable. I, I don't get it. I don't get where the disconnect is. Um, yeah. Stuart, I want to end with an observation that, you've made on on many occasions that I think is the most important thing to remind ourselves of going into 2024, which is that autocrats find a way of using our freedoms, our liberties yeah. to kill democracy. Your thoughts on that? And then I'll let you go. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's absolutely true. They use freedom of the press to kill freedom of the press. They use the ballot box to take away the vote. Um, 
And it's, it's through in the court system. You know, there was this case, just, there is this nutty theory that, you know, state legislatures should have the right to overturn any vote, not just presidential vote. As the original electors, this extension of the electors, we're not going to elect presidents by popular vote. We're going to elect electors. We're going to have smart, white, you know, rich people go and say who's going to be president. So there was a test case in front of the Supreme Court recently, and it went down six to three. And there was a lot of sort of celebration about this. This lost. But it's like, guys, I don't know. Three people in the Supreme Court think that that's the law. You're a lot further ahead than you were in 1984 when you had this little cozy symposium at Yale on where the future of the conservative Jewish area is. They didn't have three people in the Supreme Court to support that. So um, I don't think that we can count on the judiciary uh, alone to defend us. Um, I am 100% convinced that if Mike Pence thought that he could have gotten away with it, he would not have done what he did. I mean, so what does that mean? What is the main extension we have to exercise those freedoms is to vote. And this is the great hope of America. And I am hopeful about this, you know, it's with young people. You know, when I was coming up in politics, there's one truism was that young people don't vote in large numbers, and they are now. And Biden's best group, the oldest guy ever elected president in 2020, was under 30 voters. And, you know, you look at, at Arizona, Carrie Lake did lose. She lost by like 17,000 votes. Why? Go look at the precincts around the colleges and universities. She was getting, she was getting beat 85 to 15 in large numbers. If that had been 60, she would have won. So, I think that that is very hopeful. Um, and immigrants. America's a history of being saved by our immigrants. I, I probably need to stop you there, Stuart, because that is the first hopeful note we've had. Um, and I, I like agree. I like ending on on the upstroke. Um, thank you so much. I share that hope. I think we're going to win in 2024. Um, but we need to be scared. And this book, if, if you need nightmare fuel, this book will do it. Um, it's motivation more than fear. Thanks so much, Stuart. Uh, thanks, Ken. Thanks for everything you guys are doing. Hey, Midas Mighty. Love this report? Continue the conversation by following us on Instagram, at Midas Touch, to keep up with the most important news of the day. What are you waiting for? Follow us now.